give you a sense of uh, Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb. Becky and I uh, had a sabbatical in 2015 and went to Egypt and the Sinai Peninsula and Israel, of course, and Transjordan. But the highlight was um, climbing Mount Sinai in the middle of the night. First mm -hmm. three quarters of the summit was on camel. And then wow. we hiked the old Syrian steps right up to the top. Oh. And, um, and I tell you, it, um, it's just, it's actually was on Western Palm Sunday. So um, why don't we just look at those and then we'll have our prayer in a bit. So Tyler, we've got some, let's see if we can get those up for us. Yeah. Okay, that's the summit of Mount Sinai. Mm from the uh, down at the monastery. And it's, it's um, I'm not gonna get into all the different theories about if this is the real, this is the traditional site. And um, so let's go to the next one. This is the door to St. Catherine's Monastery, which is very old. And the first, it was, you know, goes back to the first several uh, centuries after um, the time of the apostles and it's, down in south, it's down in the south central part of the Sinai Peninsula, and it's um, the Roman monks there, and they've been Greek monks as well over the years. And uh, they had a couple of the, of the great uh, codexes of the New Testament there, Codex Sinaiticus. Mm -hmm. So, see, so you can see the palms there. That's cool. So, next slide. This is inside Saint Catherine's, and. Um, and you can see the uh, way up to the mountain up behind there. Mm -hmm. So um, it was towards evening, but it was still light. I'm gonna do the next one. Okay, this is an interesting picture. Do you see that bush behind there? Mm -hmm. That is called um, uh, Rubia Sanctus. And uh, they think that's the species of bramble that um, was on fire that didn't burn up. And that's been there for a long time. Um, in Arizona, they have a thing called a, uh, uh, a creosote bush. The closest equivalent of getting the feel of it is a very scrawny piece of scotch a broom. Um, it's, it's, you know, God didn't pick a cedar tree to come in. He picked the scroungiest little plant you know that's it right there rubius sanctus and that's the courtyard in the monastery the next slide okay we oh. went up at night on camels and um our uh, bedouin guide was we were handed over to our bedouin guide becky and i and a, and a, a nurse from alabama and with everybody else in the bus went to sleep they do it at night so they don't take up a whole day and everybody can go on to the next site but the Crazy people go up the mountain. It was very cold. And um, I, uh, and there's our camels. We'd taken a break there and stopped. We we're still going uphill right there. Next uh -huh. picture. Wow. Yeah, the guy there is a young dad and um, the, the uh, Palestinian, the Bedouin. He was a Bedouin. And this is how he made his money. He took people up. This is a little. Um, it's not a Starbucks, but it's a kind of little coffee shop about three quarters of the way up the mountain. And that, that gal there is the nurse that went up with us. Mm. And now we're getting ready to climb and you go up there and then at the crack of dawn, you go the rest of the way. So you see dawn come up on the mm -hmm. top of Mount Sinai. There it is. Oh, wow. Oh. Oh. Awesome. Yeah, and you know how it says that Moses hid in the cleft of the rock when the Lord passed by and pronounced his name, the Lord, mm -hmm. the Lord, mercy. Mm -hmm. we, we were in a cleft of a rock right at the very top of this thing. Mm -hmm. But that's coming up from, you know, on the east, of course, over the, mm -hmm. that's amazing. over the earth. And we're right up on top. Next picture. Yeah. This mm -hmm. there's a little chapel at the very top. And, uh, it was cold. Okay. Yeah, and there's going downhill. We didn't ride back down here because it's safer to walk. But uh, this is coming down the trail from the summit. 
Uh, this is getting near in the morning, having been on the mountain all night. That's St. Catherine's Monastery, this very, very, very ancient monastery. There you go. So one more. Yeah, okay, we'll look at this in a little bit. But um, so uh, I'm going to read the text now. From Exodus 3. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there Malach Yahweh, the angel or messenger of the Lord, appeared to him in a flame of fire from within the bush. And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place you are standing is holy ground. I had a very good friend who whenever he preached, he took off his shoes. In that text, hmm. verse 13. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God, see, you got, he got commissioned as well as he met God. Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me. Me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. And we'll look at the I am parts of John's gospel. Then Deuteronomy 33, 16, this speaks of God's blessing. May you be blessed with the best gifts of the earth and the favor of him who dwells in the burning bush. Hmm. So let's pray together. Dear God, our, our Heavenly Father, we pray this night that you would illumine our hearts as we open your word. Make yourselves, yourself known to us, even as you made yourself known to Moses in the bush that burned, but that was not burnt up. Well, let's think about this. God's plan for Moses' life was that he would lead the people out of Egyptian slavery through the wilderness to the edge of the promised land. But before that could happen, Moses had to come face to face with the God of his fathers. Now, through a providential chain of events, Moses sur survived an Egyptian genocide of Hebrew baby boys. He was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter and raised in the palace. But at age 40, Moses killed an Egyptian who was attacking a Jewish guy. And so he fled into the desert to escape, but he ended up living in the wilderness of Midian and Sinai for 40 years with its savage crags and its awful silences and its blazing desert heat. Why does God sometimes lead us into desert places? In Deuteronomy 8, verse 2, God explains this. God says, and he says this to the, all of the children of Israel, but it applies particularly to Moses, who got out there a lot earlier than the rest of them. Here's why he sent him into the wilderness. And God says, you shall remember how the Lord your God led you all the way through those years in the wilderness, to humble you and test you and to know what was in your heart. Um, there's this old uh, saying, it's been around for over a hundred years, but it, it's, I, I, it might've been Dwight Moody or somebody. I can't remember exactly where, where it comes from, but um, it goes like this. Moses spent the first 40 years of his life thinking that he was somebody. Oh. Although at that first, he didn't know exactly who, who he was. He spent the second 40 years of his life learning that he was a nobody. And in his final 40 years, 
Moses discovered what God can do with a nobody. Now, it was on an otherwise very uneventful work day in an isolated place on the backside of Sinai that something quite wonderful happened. Suddenly, Moses saw at the foot of Mount Sinai a strange flame burning in a thorn bush. Now, there's nothing odd about that. Bushes burn all the time, except this bush didn't burn up. Then Moses, then God spoke to Moses out of this mysterious fiery little bit of vegetation. And Moses took off his shoes because he was on holy ground, the very presence of Almighty God. And it was here that Moses learned how the one true living God is personal, knowable, and loving. Now, theologians um, describe the burning bush as a theophany, a God sighting. The triune God, the one true God, dwells in an eternal dimension beyond time and space, and yet he regularly breaks into our world to make himself known to us. In our text we read, the messenger of the Lord, or Malach Yahweh, the angel of the Lord, we don't know, there's discussion of what that is, appeared to Moses in the flame of fire, but it was God in this thorn bush. Who, who, who was this voice in the burning bush? In John chapter five, verse 46, we hear our Lord Jesus, and he does this all through John's gospel with these I am verses. Um, Jesus identifies himself as the, the I am who spoke from the burning bush. Jesus said before Abraham, I am, and I am is the name of him who spoke to Moses from the holy flame. So Jesus is identifying himself with a voice from the burning bush. Here's John Calvin. With the ancient teachers of the church, we rightly understand Jesus Christ to be God's messenger, the one who speaks to us from the burning bush and claiming for himself the glory of the eternal God. Now, last week, um, I really appreciated uh, Jim and how he helped us to understand that before God appeared to Moses, Moses was still quite unsure of his identity. Was he a Hebrew or an Egyptian? Remember? Moses received his name, not from his uh, actual Hebrew parents, but from Pharaoh's daughter. He was educated as an Egyptian, and when he met the girls at the well, one of whom became his wife, Zipporah, they thought that he was an Egyptian because he dressed like an Egyptian. But deep down, I think Moses knew that he was a Hebrew. So part of Moses' early struggle in the desert was to answer two questions. Who am I and who is God? Now this is really big with both Augustine and Calvin who stress this close connection between knowing who we are and knowing God. They're, it's called the reciprocal nature of the knowledge of God and self. Augustine, how can you draw close to God when you are far from your own self? And then he prayed, grant, Lord, that I might know myself, that I might know thee. And here's Calvin. Our wisdom consists almost entirely of two parts. This is in the first chapter of the Institutes of the Christian Religion. The knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. But as these are connected together by many ties, it is not easy to determine which of the two precedes and gives birth to the other. In other words, when Moses met God in the holy flame, he was also in that same act confronting himself. Okay, so here's our first discussion question. You know, we got all the noise in this culture and all the identity things and blah, blah. It just goes on and on. But for us, the question is this. How has your relationship, how has our relationship with Jesus helped us to discover our truest self? That is who we really are as a human being. And I'm going to ask Bob to help us because we really got into this in the men's Bible studies Saturday, didn't we? 
Um, and the other question that comes from this is, can you distinguish between your true self, who you really are, and your socially contrived self, right? Mm -hmm. So how, have you, how has knowing Jesus helped you to understand yourself? Let me just leave it with that. Well, he's kind of like a knife. He cuts, he cuts away that outer shell you've made for yourself yeah. and gets to your center. Yeah. Yeah, we talked Saturday, didn't we, Bob, about you have to, you have to present yourself to the world in a certain way to get the job or to, you know, appear this way and socially acceptable and so forth. And so we have a contrived self. But God sees who we are. You know where that was done? Remember when um, Samuel went to find the next king of Israel? Remember? And, and Jesse brought all the boys in, you know? And um, I mean, they're really good looking guys and whatever. And he went down to each one and great resumes. And, and he said, none of these guys are the guy, right? You got another son? Oh, yeah, but I didn't even call him. That's that scrubby kid, my youngest, David. He's out there with a sheep. And do you remember the verse that what Samuel said to him? God doesn't see like people see. He sees the deep heart. He sees who we really are. Mm. One of the saddest things about not believing in Jesus is you really have no clue who you are. So, other other thoughts on on the idea of knowing who you really are. But what would that do for you to have a real sense of who you are? For me, it was uh, finding out that there's much more to me. Yeah. Than I thought that there was, and that I thought of myself in in a certain way. And once I found out, you know, my relationship with <laughs> Jesus. Um, what really matters in my life brought out probably better behaviors and um, the goal of really researching and finding out who I am and yeah. what I should be and what, what Jesus wants me to be. Yeah. It reminds me, Carol, that reminds me of the Mark Laberton quote that he, uh, he resisted Christianity because he thought it he thought it made your life smaller rather than larger. He's like, okay. and it, he, he's like, I converted once I realized that Jesus actually saves me from the very smallness that I was afraid of. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's a, th this is a really important thing to, uh, you know, some people talk about putting on your church face or your Rotary Club <laughs> face or, you know, I want to appear a certain way. And that's all fine, you know. I mean, I told the guys on Saturday that I'd never been hired for a job. I'd been elected. Well, how do you get elected? <laughs> well, you you got to, you, you know, you can't, you know, you got to be present them, right? So there's this great pressure, but that's not who we really are. There's a, um, I'll share this one thing, personal thing. Um, so in Hamlet, there, there's this guy Polonius who has a son named Laertes. Mm -hmm. And Laertes is going to go off to the big, I guess thinks he's going to Paris or something. Remember that speech? This above all, to thine own self be true. Be true. And it shall follow as night the day thou shalt not prove false to any man. And uh, one of the odd things about being in recovery from alcoholism is that um, after a year, you get this coin that has a number on how many years you have without uh, have, ever having a drink. And um, on the top, the, the, that coin says, to thine own self be true. Because if we try to make a change to please other people, it's not going to work. 
You got to do it for yourself in some real deep way. And so I think that's, you know, in the, in the presence of God, that's the only place where we will really discover who we actually are. Anybody else got a comment on this? Oh, that's cool. Well, I do. I was thinking about um, when Moses came down from the mountain and he, his face was too brilliant. So he had to put a veil over his face. Yeah. So everybody couldn't just like look at the brightness of the reflection of God in him. And people put veils over their faces all the time um, that tell people how they want to be seen. I mean, yeah. it tells others how they want to be seen or what they want to be identified for. Mm -hmm. And um, that used to be a problem. <laughs> so um, yeah. when I came back to Christ, I just went through baptism in Island Lake and was dunked instead yeah. of infant baptism. And it was like, um, you know, I died of Christ and I'm raised to eternal life or raised with Jesus. Like you just die with them and you're yeah. raised. Again. And then all those pretenses, I don't have to do that anymore. That's right. Um, I think what you see is what you get pretty much with me. <laughs> so I, mean, I don't pretend I'm not a competitor. I don't want to compete. With there you go. Serve. Yeah. So, right. you know after paul got beat up for years for being a follower of jesus he says by the grace of god i am what i am yeah let no man bother me <laughs> mm -hmm. in other words you should be concerned you know about interacting with other people but right. you don't you just don't have to you don't have to prove anything to anybody anymore yeah. You, you just belong to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so if somebody wants to blame you or call you a terrible name, like you're just a terrible person, you're a sinner and all this, I say, just tell me something I don't already know. I mean, <laughs> I, I you know, I'm saved by grace. It's all I got. So let's talk about this um, bush. And uh, it's this desert bramble called rubus sanctus and that was the big one that they'd been growing for a long time i think they probably watered that guy so it looked good but um, <laughs> the ones out on the desert not so um so he saw this bush and it was filled with flame but it didn't burn up how do we understand the images of fire and God in the Bible. Well, there's a several of them that are that do burn stuff up. <laughs> How about this? Deuteronomy 4:24, we read, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire. And Isaiah 33, 14. Who can live in the devouring fire of God's presence? And, you know, then there was fire on the mountain and they don't come near, right? Mm -hmm. So the biblical symbol of fire most usually refers to the way in which God destroys evil and evildoers. You know, the hellfire, right? Because it just burns them up. But the fire in this bush did not uh, in, in incinerate the scrubby little plant. Now it engulfed it, but it did not destroy it. So here is a biblical image of God's fiery, fiery presence that's not fiery wrath to you know, devour the, the evildoer, but of mm -hmm. God's gentle life-giving flame of loving kindness. See how different the images are? Mm -hmm. It's one thing to ask, is God powerful? But the deeper question is, does God care about me? Is God merciful enough, kind enough to help me? So I think the burning bush that Moses saw points us to the love and comfort and rest and peace of Christ. It's the place of rest and of healing, and of peace, and of being spiritually warmed. Calvin said this, Those who are devoted to this world, and not to the heavenly life, become exhausted by their endless attempts to find peace 
in earthly things. But the gentle flame of God's love burns in our hearts and, and restores our soul. In Christ, God calms our frazzled minds and heals our emotional brokenness. And I think what the Holy Spirit does, and that, that's what the image of the flame is, is that he recenters us in our true self. Mm -hmm. That's why he said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me all you who are weary and worn out and you will find in me rest for your souls. I also think, and I've thought this for many years, that the gentle image of Sinai's holy flame is um, found later on on the day of Pentecost. Yeah. Remember what happened on the day of Pentecost? What, what came down and sat on everybody's head? Tongues of fire. Flame of fire, right? Mm -hmm. The supernatural flame rested on the heads of each of the disciples. And as they had that flame, they know two things. First was the love of God, which they testified to. And then God commissioned them to do a job. Now, so Pentecost restates the experience of Moses at the burning bush. And Pentecost, these 50 days, it was an Old Testament festival. Remember what it was, Shavuot? It's the time the Jews celebrated all the gifts God had given them at Sinai. So I think that the flame in the burning bush and the flames of Pentecost are the same holy fire of God's presence that now touches us as the cure for a wounded soul. And at the same time, gives us the significance of a calling of some kind, right? We have something to do. And there's nobody who doesn't, Christian, who doesn't have a calling, you know? You know, I'm, I got retired a couple of years. I got a calling, right? That there's many things that God's got, got me doing. Exodus 3, 2. Though the bush was burning, it did not burn up. Now think about this. God's flame is inexhaustible. It needs no earthly fuel. Mm -hmm. What happens when you don't put wood on the campfire? Out. Yeah. God works and is never weary. Forever and ever throughout all the everlasting ages, God's holy flame is never depleted. As opposed to us, for we are short lived yeah. creatures. Yeah. We're here for only a brief moment, and then our fuel is exhausted and our little candle flickers out but the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. One of the things that um, you, we do on Ash Wednesday, you know, to dust you are and dust you return. And sometimes um, when I've done the ashes, we go, you know, dust you are and to dust you shall return. But the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. Mm -hmm. see. So um, let's talk about being comforted. Um, You know, think about the worst things that have ever happened to you. You know, things that you've lost. Um, how has, how have you went and, and you've experienced comfort and you know it didn't come from positive thinking or, you know, trying harder, but it was for actually from God. Why don't we share a couple of those experiences? Those really are encouraging to me to hear. When you got comfort, or like I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, you had the peace that passes understanding. You wonder, how can I be in the middle of this and have peace? Let's talk about that. He Obviously, allows you to cry out to him, but yeah. the same time you're crying out. Yeah. You have that comfort and that peace knowing that he is there for you. 
Yeah. And it's funny that you use the analogy of your candle going out because I see it as an everlasting candle in my soul that yeah. shows me the way and guides me no matter what I'm going through. But you mm -hmm. see, that's from John 1, and that's the light from God, for the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has neither understood it nor been able to quench it. So that's the Jesus light in your soul <clears throat> that, that God has given to us. Or maybe he brings it back from the image of God that was damaged in us. Yeah. I've known some pretty desperate people, and... Um, but if they get Jesus, <laughs> they're going to make it. The being comforted. What, what is it to be comforted? The comforter is to, the part of Kaleo is it's God comes and sits down next to you. You're call, God is called to be by your side, I guess would be the better way to say that. This feels like his arms are wrapped around me. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, we had a 15 year old boy in our subdivision who was visiting his grandparents and he killed himself about mm -hmm. six months ago. Well, oh my gosh. Stuff, stuff, terrible stuff happens. But if we have the Lord, we have that comfort that's way within us. And Calvin said, you don't get that from all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. I was joking this morning with some friends and uh, they were talking about, you know, just the old classic thing about you. Uh, if you have a lot of money or a lot of possessions or all this stuff, you know what? They, they're great and whatever, but it, it doesn't go all the way to give you comfort or peace and uh, let alone eternal life. And it's an off quoted, it's an often quoted story about after John D. Rockefeller died and his accountant and his attorney, apparently, it's not an apocryphal story, gave a press, you know, had a press conference and they got, the reporter said, well, how much did Mr. Rockefeller leave? And the attorney said, well, he left all of it. <laughs> Can't uh, you? Yeah. It's subtle, but I like that. Um, and these things pass human thinking. You can't think your way into these things. They just come from, the, the Greek word is, it's, it's, it's out beyond you. The, it passes all understanding. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, how can I have this peace and this comfort in the middle of this situation, right? And you do. Doesn't mean you don't, don't grieve, but cry or cry out to the Lord. All right. Um, so this, is a, this next little section is really quite interesting. Um, so, you know, Moses is going to get called and... Um, and Moses asks God, what is your name? I, if I go back to Egypt, uh, bring all the Israelites out, the world, who is that that you sent you again? We don't, we don't know that. You know, there's the old story that, that uh, Abraham came and told Sarah, his wife in Mesopotamia, that, that, um, that uh, they were going to have to pack up and go to this place where they didn't know where they were going. And, and, uh, he said, well, well, how did you know this? He said, he told me. And Sarah said, who's he? Who, who's, who is this? And that's what, that's what uh, Moses um, figured the uh, people were going to say. And he said, I am who I am. This is my name forever. Now, here's an interesting thing. Every false god gets its name from the human beings who invented it, right? But no human being gave God his name. Scholars refer to God's name as the tetragrammaton, the four-lettered word, let's say. 
because it has four Hebrew letters, Y-H-W-H, yod Hey vav Hey, And Orthodox Jews in particular mm -hmm. never say it out loud. And I was taking a Hebrew class at the UW in, uh, back in the 60s, and I was in there with a bunch of Jewish guys, and um, the secular professor was pronouncing the name, and boy, these guys were getting creeped out by it. And everybody was kind of tense when he would not, when he would actually say the name out loud rather than Adonai, yod -Hey -Vav. And so this, what happened was this one day, he, he said the name out probably to bother everybody. And the janitors down in the, in the, in the, in the floor above us started ripping up old desks from the floor. The minute he said the name, everybody creeped out, including the professor anyway. It's the holy name so holy that the- uh, The floor creeped that uh, the Jews will not say it out loud. Um, Yahweh is often what people think it was, but we don't really know. Jehovah or all these names. Yeah. But it's taken from those, those letters form the Hebrew verb to be. So God's name, it, it, it doesn't, it, uh, you can't even identify it with a present or future tense. It means I am who I am. I always was and I will always be, because God is not bounded like we are by time. God has no beginning or end. Our living Lord is with us right now, but his life is eternal. He has always been. There's never been a time God didn't exist, and yet he's right here in the present moment, which means that God only loves us, but he loves us with an undying love, a steadfast love that endures forever. And I've often thought that the, I had a wonderful dad, you know, but the difference between my earthly dad and my, and my heavenly father is my dad died, but my heavenly father is always with me. So from the center of the flame, God said to Moses, I am who I am. That is my name. This, people have said, is the most important fact in the universe. God is. Now, how many facts are there in the universe? Well, there's billions and billions of facts. Two plus two is four, except if you live in Oregon these days. Um, the, 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 there's just facts. You know, Washington is the evergreen state. You know, there's just so many facts. Well, think of God is, is the fact that stands behind every other fact. God exists. And it's to this God that the Holy Spirit draws us to totally abandon ourselves to him, this one who speaks from Sinai's holy fire. Um, and we are reminded of that thing I talked about recently about Luther, who said, when God doesn't seal, seem real enough to us, then sooner or later we will take matters into our own hands, trying to live without God in the world. This is a project that never ends well. And so God exists and we hold on to that. Not only does he exist, he loves us. Now this is this Deuteronomy verse, I think is actually a benediction of some kind. And of course, Deuteronomy was, it's the second giving of the law, Moses' second, second um, speaking about the law. Deuteronomy 33, six. You're being blessed by the goodwill of him who appeared in the burning bush. You see, in Christ, God looks kindly upon us. For just as God revealed to Moses who he was and who Moses was and who Mo what Moses was called to do, so we know that in Jesus Christ, love God, God loves us very much and wants only the best for us. And he's promised to work all things together for good to those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. But here's the problem. Sometimes really terrible things happen in life. And I think this verse um, that, uh, that, you know, the loving kindness and favor and goodwill of God is, is pronounced upon us by the one who speaks to us from the burning bush. Um, and it's this kindness and um, 
affirmation that we receive from the Lord that gets us through the worst times in our lives. Now, there's another um, use of the image of fire in the Old Testament, and it's persecution. We find it, for example, in 1 Peter 4.12. It speaks of the fire of persecution. Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery troubles that come upon you, right? I call the fire of persecution or the fire of hostility the, the, mm. the hell fire. This is why the burning bush is an appropriate symbol for the church. Um, because down through the ages, the uh, church has seen times of terrible fires of animosity that rage against it, but um, have, have never just been able to destroy it. So, Tyler, are you hiding there in the <laughs> Zoom somewhere? You want to put that symbol up for us on the, the old logo of the Church of Scotland? Do you have that there? This is not a very big picture. You can find it. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the, the, and the um, um, you know, the, the Latin means... The, tr the bush burned, but didn't burn up. And it's an evergreen bush. And I'm going to tell you the story about that. Um, that We today call it a logo or a seal was what they called it. So, you know, I study all kinds of odd things. And um, um, the, the 18th century in particular was a time of terrible persecution for the Presbyterian Church of Scotland. They had this king named Charles I and his son Charles II. And um, down in England, you know, it was Cromwell that he fought. But um, one of the things he did in Scotland, because it was the United Kingdom by that time, was that he um, wanted the Catholic Church to take over Scotland after the, the Reformation of John Knox. And um, there's the Covenanters and so forth. And um, actually got a couple of them in my family tree. One, one guy by the name of James Renwick, whose sister came to America on a prison ship. She was a Covenanter, a Presbyterian. And uh, they hanged him in the Haymarket in the street in Edinburgh. I've seen his name right there on the street even to this day. And from time to time, Christians of all varieties have come under persecution. And so this burning bush was selected as the logo for the Presbyterian Church of Scotland during those persecution times. And there's, this is not maybe the original one, but I'm gonna to put together to, for you how I think this became that symbol. So they saw the burning bush as the church. I mean, what is it that the, the flame of God's love exists in? Well, it's in the church. And the, the, uh, the Latin phrase says it was on fire, but it wasn't destroyed by the fire. So the, the, the burning bush kind of fireproofed the church from hellfire. Not that we wouldn't be persecuted, not that James Renwick wouldn't have been hung in Haymarket Street, but there's something resilient about the Christian church when it's under attack. And it's like, because the fire didn't burn the bush, I call it, it's kind of like Holy Spirit fireproofing of the church, because no matter how hard you try to destroy the church of Jesus, we're always going to come back. Not that we won't take some serious hits. So I just love that, um, that image of the resiliency of the church. And, you know, today, what, look at all the stuff we face, you know, the what's going to happen after the, the, uh, COVID thing is over and you know what's the future and you know all sorts of dire predictions and but I just believe that uh, the church has been fireproofed from the flames of hell and uh, the gates of hell Jesus said are not going to prevail against her and I think that's a real comfort for me I think the church is the only institution 
that will survive. And Tyler mentioned this in his last sermon, referencing political groups and so forth. The church mm -hmm. is the only institution that will survive the fire, the great fire of the end times, because we are grounded in Christ. And um, I think what that does for me, when I think about the, the uh, we, I have another connection with a guy named Alexander McFadden, who, uh, you know, he was chased down all his life in the, in the 17th century and they didn't kill him, but they put him on a prison island off the coast of Scotland. And, and, um, and there's persecution everywhere. And I think the persecution the church gets, wherever you got it, that's what you got to deal with. It's, you can't compare yourself with other people and say, well, my persecution isn't that bad. Our persecution is what it is, you know? But um, we know that the church will endure and that we will endure. So when life seems to go against you, um, that's when, and when your dreams don't come true and things happen and you experience a loss or whatever, Paul says in Romans 8.31, he says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Now that is a great Bible verse. Mm -hmm. If God is for us, who can be against us? At St. Andrews in Tucson, they sang this song, I See Victory. And it was just the coolest song. It basically says that uh, God's going to win. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm going to bring that back with me. I, I've been playing it on my cell phone. Um, if God is for us, who can be against us? So I want you to take a minute and think now about this question. If this is true, the Bible is true. If God is for us, who can be against us? What evidence do you have in your life that God is for you and that God is on your side? This is you as a person. What evidence do you have? Think about that for a minute. God is for you. God is for us. Who can be against us? What evidence do we have? Of that? What do you think? Oops. <laughs> well, I was just thinking of the the God is for us part of that. That um, when my when my husband died and everything was under the responsibility of me to take care of everything Yeah. Um, with him and with everything and, and with the house and, and everything. It's like, God, I can't do this. Yeah. And somehow I could, and it wasn't me that was doing it. It was God working through me. Mm -hmm. And the fact, the fact that he was there every step of my way and I could feel, I could just feel a presence with me that got me through that, that tough time. Yeah. And I know Tacey said the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. What's, what's the evidence? I'll share one thing. So the last couple of weeks we've been down here. My, my successor at St. Andrews, a guy named Jim Toole. He's 50 years old. He's been them with 11 years since I left. And at age 50... He got liver cancer, <laughs> had about two weeks to live. And you can't believe the devastation, you know, the, the, how people are feeling. But what's interesting is that my friends are all 70 and they remember a lot of things that happened at St. Andrews back down through the years. And they're telling the younger people and some of them are crying too. I mean, it's really tough. Well, you know, God's always seen us through the difficulties. God's, God's always seen us through the difficulties. And we were at a dinner party with one of the session members. And she said, the young elders, I just say, God's always seen us through. He's going to see us through this one too. And um, they remember that there's evidence that God is for us. Um, I just am really encouraged. And, um, what, what, what evidence have you seen that God has got your back, God's on your side? This is in the good way. 
not as opposed to, well, he doesn't like that guy, but he likes me. It's just, God is for me. That's why it's good news, actually. Mm -hmm. Well, you've got things you're thinking about. So um, I think that to know Jesus Christ is to be fireproofed from the fires of hell. Not that we won't suffer. It's not that all things are good, but that God works all things together for good. So anyway, I've loved this text about the burning bush. And when I actually got to crawl up there in the cleft of the rock where God passed, passed over, I think to myself, man, this is pretty cool. And um, anyway, any final thoughts you might have or comments before we call it an evening? Joe, what country is uh, the burning bush? Is it Egypt, uh, Jordan? Well, it's the, it's the Sinai Peninsula, which the, the Jews, remember, conquered in, that, in, in, the, in, the, in 1967 in the Seven Day War. Mm -hmm. And then um, they made treaty with the peace with Egypt. But when you go in there, you go, you go, you go in there um, by bus, a couple, 300 miles, either on the, from the east side or the west side. They don't go in from the Egypt side anymore because of terror. But they come in and every like 25, 30 miles, you got the UN with the blue helmets on. And, um, and when we left Sinai, we had, an, we, we had with some other tour groups, we were escorted by all kinds of guys and we had in our bus we we had Syria we had Egyptian Christian guides and um, we, we also had it with our true bus a guy named Mr. Mahdi an Egyptian Coptic Egyptian and uh, Mr. Mahdi um, he had a military style mustache he had a perfect haircut he had shined shoes his pants had a crisp crease on it and his coat was perfect and under his coat, there was this large bulge. <laughs> and he was obviously Egyptian military. And after getting out of the service, he was in the tour bus. And we were all kind of glad for Mr. Mahdi. And um, when we'd come to a place, the tour guide would say, now friends, Mr. Mahdi's gonna go out and we'll just let him look around. And so we'd sit there and Mr. Mahdi would come back and say something and he says, Mr. Mahdi says we should go out and enjoy ourselves here at this site, you know. <laughs> but he watched us like a sheepdog, you know. But it's a dangerous place, Sinai Peninsula. But way down south where the mountain is, there's no terrorism so much. It's just Bedouins and uh, uh, this very holy place. It's way out there. You know, I rode the uh, mule to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, and I realized yeah. how safe the mule really. I mean, I, I really felt very confident that he that that mule was going to not fall. But uh, how did you feel about the camel? <laughs> well, they, they recommend that you go up on the camel and that you walk down. Yeah. Uh, and uh, because they, you know, they're pretty tippy guys, but. Man alive, that was really something. We were, the three of us, Becky and I and this nurse who went with us, it was full moon and we were going up the side of, of Mount Sinai on this fairly narrow path. Mm -hmm. And the moon was over to our left-hand side and it was shining on us. And I looked over and on the rock wall, we were silhouetted, three of us on camels. And I thought, man, that's a Christmas card. <laughs> it's exactly what it looked like. Cool. Yeah. What was the elevation gain? Say again, please. What was the elevation gain? Oh, do you know what the elevation is? You know, it was several thousand feet. Um, it's pretty high. Uh, but uh, when you're used to looking at Mount Denali, you know, it's everything's not high, but the um the uh but it, it was it was several hours to get three quarters of the way up on the camel and then another couple hours maybe to go on the old syrian steps that the monks had built on a thousand years ago wow egyptian but, uh, so how do you actually get on the camel i mean uh, when you're way out there in the <laughs> well um i was i was 
scheduled for hip surgery. Oh. And so I had a little bit of the arthritis in my hip, but you know, it's, it's like, you know, they'll, they'll help you, but you just, you just put your foot in the stirrup and Bedouin guy just pulled me up, you know, or you can jump yeah, the stirrup, the That's pretty high up. I mean, yeah, yeah. it is. Uh -huh. And the sa the saddles are pretty tiny, you know. You just really have to not like a horse, not like riding a horse at all. When yeah. we were in Egypt, yeah. remember we were riding. Oh, it was, and they are so dirty. And, and, <laughs> and, oh. and, oh. Yeah. Well, these camels were working camels, and um, oh. they were owned by the Bedouins. And so you went out, and they said you have to have twenty five dollars. American cash, and we gave it to that young dad there who was our guide, and he went over and they talked to Arabic, and then they gave us our camels. It was re really something. We felt very safe with him Good. and with the monks in the monastery who kind of oversee the thing. But anyway, they also have Elijah's cave up there. Oh, yeah. That's so that's neat. You know, I think the mountain is the place, but. Well, I just came out of them. Anyway, that was a wonderful one of the coolest experience. things I've ever done in my life. Yeah. So, anybody else got a thought? It's open ended here. Well, that song keeps coming in my mind, "Refining Fire," and so I was thinking oh, yeah. about Luther's being on the with the burning bush and God refining him for the job he had yet to do. Well, you remember I quoted those verses at the, at the start from Deuteronomy, um, what was the um, 316, where he says, you know, why does God lead us into the desert place? And he says it's to, uh, let me just find that. Um, uh, yeah, he says, um, so that um, he can refine us and uh, that he can find out and test us and find out what's in our hearts. I think that's really something. Mm -hmm. that, um, yeah. he, uh, we need to pray for your friend, Joe. Pardon me? We need to be praying for your friend. Yeah, yeah, it's... Um, so sorry. I've never seen anything. And his wife also has cancer. Mm -hmm. okay. They're okay. 50 and... Uh, they, um, Fuller, you know, get seminary. Yeah. Um, yeah, Jim Tool and Patty, uh, their two sons oh. are in college. And um, mm -hmm. I tell you, I was telling Tyler, it was just like, hmm. like two weeks of grief work with all our friends. Right. So anyway, he's showing them how to die as well as how to live. It's really a remarkable. All right. Um, shall we close with a word of prayer? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That yeah, yeah. My my pleasure. It's a great honor, thank Heavenly you. Father. Thank you for your Word. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Thank you for these great texts. We do pray for Jim Tool and uh, Patty, and that you comfort him. And we pray for. Um, all of us, and we always pray for Tyler and Brittany too, as they lead us here. Touch them and comfort them and assure them that you're on their side, and that um, they've been fireproofed by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And um, now we give ourselves to you and our congregation here in Jesus' name, amen. 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 I'm coming back to Paul's boat. All right. Good. Yay. It's 30 in the morning. All right, then. Ooh. We'll Plastic see. Airlines, three frights a day. We'll see. So, we'll see you Friday night, then. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. We'll be there, totally. Okay. Yeah, wouldn't miss it. All right. Thank you, Joe. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All Thank right. You. I guess, Tyler, you got the, well, here, you got the controls. Okay. <laughs>